And we, again, are privileged to have Pastor Greg Mitchell here. It's, it's sought after all over the world, and we are truly honored that he'd come back and preach for us. Let's tell him we appreciate him tonight. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I, it is an incredible honor for me to be here, and I still uh, sometimes pinch myself, and, and I cannot believe that God allowed me to uh, come to Australia and be a part of the work of God. I see people here that I pastored. I see children of our converts. I see children of people we went to church with in Perth and just our lives are intertwined with Australia and that is a miracle. I, I told many of you are watching my uh, memorial stones. I started to tell the story of Australia last Sunday and it's an incredible miracle that God planned in advance. He knew that I would one day be in Australia and uh, it's one of the great privileges of my life that I was able to be here and be with you. So I was very honored uh, uh, when, uh, as, as Pastor said, I offered myself, but uh, he was uh, willing for me to come. So I'm glad to be able to preach to you one night on my way to New Zealand. That's why, why I'm actually on the way through. I'm going to the conference there. So I'll go tomorrow. Turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to the book of Psalm chapter 107. There's a couple, an Italian couple, Gianluigi and Raffaella Pontes. They met on a ship in the 1960s. Gianluigi was a, a ship captain ferrying tourists, and he met Raffaella there on the ship. After they married, he took a, a job, a bank, banking job. He became a banker in Geneva, Switzerland. That is a very, it's a good job. A Swiss banker is good. A good job and it's safe. But in 1970, he quit his nice, good paying, safe Swiss banker job. They took out a loan for $200,000 to buy their first ship, which was a small cargo vessel. And they started a, a shipping company. They grew by buying secondhand ships and targeting less traffic. Uh, routes. By 1979, they had amassed 17 ships. Listen to this. As of 2022, their net worth in U.S. dollars was $62.4 billion. That's like 100 billion Aussie dollars. So what they discovered is that there is wealth in the seas. The scripture that we're going to read is talking about the work of God and it talks about those who do business on the sea and it actually is simply a lesson for us, not about oceans, it's about risk. That is that if you want to do anything for God in life, you have to risk and I want to preach a message I've entitled Wonders in the Deep. Psalms 107, 23 through 30. Those who go down to the sea in ships who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind which lifts the waves of the sea. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro. They stagger like a drunken man, and they are at their wit's end. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble. He brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so its waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet. So he guides them to their desired haven. Wonders in the deep. I want to begin. I want to talk about wonders in the deep. There is something in the heart of people that craves security. They want to be free from danger. They want to be free from threats. And many people, they do not like the feeling of not being in control. They hate the feeling of feeling out of control. Maybe that was in their past. There are people that in their past, they had events 
that made them feel completely out of control, abuse, abandonment, poverty, divorce, relationship breakdown. And they remember that feeling, the world is in chaos and there was nothing you could do to fix it. So there are people, they say, I will never feel like that again. I don't ever want to put myself in a situation where my world feels out of control. So many people, they try to remove all the elements of uncertainty in life. Ecclesiastes 11.4, those who wait for perfect weather will never plant seeds. Those who look at every cloud, they will never harvest crops. There are some people, they want safe beds, no risk. They do not want to feel out of control. In France, some years back, they were going to pass a law that allowed someone, if you're under age 26, if you signed a contract with a job, that if you're under 26 and you weren't doing a good job, that you could be fired. When they proposed this, millions of people in France protested. They said, that is unfair. They were holding signs in French, but the translation was, we are against precariousness. 75% of 15 to 30-year-olds in France say they aspire, what do they want more than anything in life? A civil service job from which it is impossible to be fired. Right? Safe. I can never be fired. There is no risk. We want to remove the, the possibility of feeling uncomfortable. We get to a place in life, I know how to do this. I, I, I can do that, so I don't want to change. I don't want to do anything that I'm not comfortable with. When Jesus meets Peter in Luke chapter 5, he is in water washing his nets, very likely the water was only knee deep. It's shallow water. He's maintaining the nets. There's something in people's hearts that that's what they want to do. If I can just get knee deep, I'm in safely. But I don't ever want to feel uncomfortable. And above all else, we do not want the possibility of failure. I don't want to get into anything in life where it's possible to not succeed. I might lose in life. And that's simply our pride. There, there are people that they are not willing to try simply because I don't want to look foolish. I don't want to try an outreach. I don't want to go into the ministry because what if somebody asks me how the outreach went and it wasn't very good? I want to tell you, I've had some outreaches that weren't very good. I had one in South Africa when we first started. Lightning struck just before the outreach and blew up the projector. <laughs> the heavens opened. It rained. I was surprised that Noah didn't come down. <laughs> I had three little kids and a dog come to my outreach. And the dog didn't want to get saved. I mean, it was, it was not good. That's life. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man brings a snare. There are many people in their past, this is the real issue, at some point in their past, they felt foolish. They were not in control. These are rejection issues. So now they say, I will never put myself in any situation in life where I can look like a fool, where I'm not in control. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to go. There are pastors. I'm not going to plant because it might not work out. It's fascinating to me. I, I plant churches a lot. I've planted a lot of churches. And I want to be honest with you, not every church works out. Not every church planting venture is a raging success. It's fascinating. In my mind, I'm willing to send somebody. If it doesn't work out, come back in. Let's regroup. Let's... You know, get refreshed and hit it again. But it's fascinating how often there are people, I, when I sent them, they were among the best. And when I bring them back, now they barely even come to church or pray. 
because in their mind, it messes with them. They take it as a worth issue. So I just won't get involved. Because if I don't get involved, I can never get into a situation where I could fail. In our text, it shows us that the desire for security keeps us from God's best. Verse 24, they that go down the sea in ships, they will see the works of the Lord, his wonders in the deep. You will never see God at work. You will never see God's best if you play it safe. If you live for security, you are never going to see the works of God like this text. Listen, this text was written to Jewish people. Jewish people are not known for being seafarers. They're land lovers. There's a, there's a few. But so this is written to them. This was out of the ordinary for a Jewish person to go to sea. But the text is actually about risk. It's, it's not talking about personal desires, personal achievements. It is the work of God, and our call is to risk for God. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on the great waters. Verse 24 talks about the deep, because the will of God involves risk. Destiny involves risk. Risk is choices where the outcome is not certain. Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, Abraham, uh, Abraham obeyed God's call to go to another place God promised to give him. He left his own country, listen to this, not knowing where he was to go. Do you understand how outrageous that is? Can you imagine if we had conference and we announced, you know, is it, you know Bill and Susie were sending them out? Where are we sending them? They'll find out later. <laughs> Can you imagine that in your past? Are you willing to go out? Yes, pastor. Where are we going? We'll tell you later. <laughs> Who would do that? But that's exactly what God did. He said to Abraham and Sarah, to a land, your job is to go. Not knowing. That is, that's a risk. See, in life, God gives you promises he doesn't give you exact details. How will this work out? Who exactly am I going to meet? I'll tell you later. It's a risk. The outcome is uncertain. 1 Samuel 14, 6, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, let's go to the camp of the uncircumcised. Maybe the Lord will help us. That, that's incredible. We might win. We might not. But let's try. That is outrageous. That is risk. One man said sailing, our text is about sailing. Sailing is 90% pleasure and 10% sheer terror. Doing the will of God is like that. There's great pleasure. Sometimes there's terror because it's a risk. But God calls us to risk for him and his purposes. Verse 23, those who go down to the sea in ships who do business on great waters. And this is not talking about making money. This is talking about kingdom business. Establishing God's rule in a physical location. Matthew 10, 7, as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand or is here. Matthew 6, 10, may your kingdom come. That is our call is to establish God's will on the earth. You know what? We are God's rescue agents. Every believer, we are called to participate in God's great plan of rescuing lost souls held captive by the powers of hell. There are people that are lost and without hope. They're bound and addicted, headed for hell. We must rescue them, but I want to be honest with you, you have to risk in order to rescue. We risk our pride. Every time you witness, you're risking your pride. When you do an outreach on your own, you're risking your pride. When you go to do a, a, the will of God in preaching, you're risking pride. We risk our money. Kingdom ventures. There, there are many things that 
we have invested in from the Prescott Church. We have poured money in places and it didn't work out. We, we often don't have something to show tangibly, but we have to risk it anyway. We risk our plans to obey the call because that is our call. We must rescue and it takes risk in order to rescue. Listen to this, Ryan Passport. He was driving down the road one morning, uh, early one morning, on the way to work, and he saw a house that was on fire, flames coming from a bedroom window. I think they have a picture of this uh, house. This is literally what he saw. This house was absolutely on fire, pulled over by the side of the road in front of the house, and he saw three children standing outside. They told Ryan that their mother and their little brother was still inside. Ryan chose to go into that burning house. Couldn't see anything because of the smoke. He literally crawled on hands and knees until he bumped into the small child, picked him up, carried him outside, and then he went back in the second time looking for the mother, had to go deeper in the house, and uh, finally he found her lying on the floor, badly burned, struggling to breathe, brought her outside, did CPR until she suddenly took a gasp of air and sat up. Have another picture. This is a, an award ceremony. And that is him in the middle. That is the mother and one of the children that he rescued out of that house. Deputy Jason Mower said, this is the first time in 15 years of law enforcement I've ever heard of a total stranger truly going above and beyond in a way in a situation many wouldn't have dared to face. His willingness to risk his own life to help save this family was the difference between life and death for this young mother and her child. That woman, that boy was glad that Ryan risked because you have to risk in order to rescue. Let's talk secondly about at your wit's end. Some people have a mistaken idea about serving God. Do the will of God. Okay, all right, all right, I will. But in our minds, we think it goes like, we think it's like a contract. We never saw God sign it, but we're sure he did anyway. It goes like this. I will do the will of God. I will risk. But your job is to make sure that things always go well. Right? I'll I'll risk, but you have to make sure no trouble comes. Make sure we always succeed. It's like we believe that By doing the will of God, we gain holy immunity. The devil comes and we say, not today, Satan. I'm doing the will of God. And the devil goes, I was unaware of that. I will go torment someone else. That's what the devil may tell you, that you have holy immunity, but God never told you that. In our text, we see the reality of obedience and risking for God. Verse 25, where he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lift up the waves of the sea. And verse 28 talks about trouble and distress. Can I be honest with you? Serving God involves trouble. Doing the will of God, you're going to have trouble. Risking for God you will have trouble. John 16, in this world, you will have tribulation. You'll have trouble. Salvation, some of you have learned this. You were living in sin. You were a drug addict. You were a drunk. You were a thief. You were immoral. You got saved. You would think that your family would say, thank you, Jesus, that my son, my daughter, my family member, they're different. They're no longer, but that's not what happens, is it? Some of your family are upset with you because you want to do right. Giving. There are people, they think, if I give money to God, that means the tires on my car will never get flat. (laughs) I gave. Right? Nothing ever will go wrong financially. I want to tell you, you can give and risk for God. Things still break. Things go wrong. Discipleship, very common. I have young men, very sincere. They're stirred by a conference pastor. God stirred me in conference. I'm going to go for God. I want to do the will of God. I say, praise the Lord, brother. 
but I know something they don't know. And that is that in a short amount of time, a few weeks, a few months, they're going to come back to me and they're going to say, Pastor, all hell broke loose. Like I'm, I'm going for God and the transmission fell out of the car. I lost my job. I got bit by the cat, you know, whatever it might be. <laughs> and, and, they're, and they're shocked, like, I'm doing, shouldn't God then, his job is to just walk around and just slap the devil every time he comes? No, they're doing the will of God. No trouble can come. That's not true. Pastoring, pioneering, doing a work for God. There's resistance. There's demonic oppression. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong. I, I want to tell you, the devil fights. You know this? I, I just, actually just to throw this in, the uh, other we had we had been having a bunch of demonic things happening in a, in a row. My uh, grandchildren were over, and my my boys are grandsons are playing hard. They smelled like wet puppies, and so it's like go take a shower. My grandson calls. He starts screaming, and I come in my bathroom. Lisa calls me in. There's a snake in my bathroom. I have never seen a snake in my house. And right when all this trouble's going on, there's a snake, and so I reach to grab it. it. It found a tiny little hole in the wall, and as I went, it disappeared somewhere in the wall. So I went and got wasp spray. That was the most powerful thing I could spray. It's like that... <laughs> Snakes aren't natural. They don't got feet, and they can move. That's just wrong. I don't like them. <laughs> a, little, a little while later, my wife goes in to use the restroom, and she starts screaming. When I come in, this snake has gotten into my shower. Remember, it doesn't have feet. It somehow got up the glass door, wrapped itself around the handle, and was on the inside going like this. That ain't right. I personally believe that God should keep all snakes from my house. That's not. <laughs> the devil fights. Trouble. Our text says you can risk for God, you can obey God, and there will be storms. But you see, trouble has a purpose. Number one, you have trouble because the enemy fights what he fears. 2 Samuel 5, 17, when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. He heard of it, went down to the stronghold. When did the enemy attack? When David stepped into doing God's will. The devil fights what he fears. Listen, if the devil never fights you, Maybe you're on his side. <laughs> or, or maybe he's just not afraid of you. This is why there's trouble when you make a decision for God. That doesn't mean you're always going to have trouble. It just means the devil tries to discourage you and get you to turn away from doing God's will. And many people, I see it successfully. The moment there's a problem, they back off from the commitment they just made. Number two, we have trouble now, so you learn how to fight. That's why when a disciple comes and says, Pastor, I, I just said at conference, I lifted my hand and said, I'm going to do the will of God, and now all hell is breaking loose. In their minds, they think either, am I doing something wrong, or God must hate me because he's letting trouble. No, no, no. God... He does not prevent trouble because you need to learn how to fight. Can I tell you something about pastoring? Pastoring has a lot of battles. God help you if you become a pastor and you've never had to fight. You're going to be in big trouble. So God allows this so you learn. If you can fight poverty and sickness and problems now, you are learning dominion for future battles. David, when he saw the giant, he said, I have fought the lion, I fought the bear. There are battles. I was doing God's will. 
protecting the sheep, stinking lion and bear came to try to hurt. But that was God helping him because he was learning how to fight. And so do you. We have trouble, so we learn how to depend on God. Verse 27 says, they are at their wit's end. It literally means having lost or exhausted any possibility of finding a way out. They're in such trouble, they said, we don't even know what to do anymore. It is actually talking about when you reach the end of your ability and resources. Because God knows something, we tend to lean on our own understanding. We got a problem, okay, there's a problem in finances, I'll get another job, I'll get three jobs, and I'll work it out. Right? That's how we think. How can I fix this? God will let you get into storms in which you cannot work it out. Why? Because he wants you to depend on him. And fourth, we have trouble because it prepares us for the purposes of God. 2 Corinthians 4.17, for our light affliction is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Joseph and David experienced trouble in their life, but the trouble they were experiencing was actually preparing them for a greater purpose. Corey Tembaum said, every experience God gives us, every person he puts in our lives is the perfect preparation for the future that only he can see. Let's talk finally about God in the storm. Because in our text it says there will be storms. You have to risk. And he says you're going to see God in the storm. Think about that. What happens when you risk for God? Our text says, number one, you will survive. God allows you to get into storms not because he's trying to drown you. It is not his intention that you drown. He wants you to survive. Verse 28 and 29, he brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so its waves are still. Common saying that I, I hear people, they hear of a tragedy, a problem, a crisis, at one point, my, our daughter backslid, and there are people like, oh, I, I could never handle that. I, I could never handle that. You know what? You can handle a lot more than you think because God will help you to survive. The safest place to be is in the will of God. This is counterintuitive. In other words, it, it doesn't seem like it should make sense. If you try to remove risk, you actually put yourself in more risk. Listen to this. A man, the true story, he said that he and his son, they went rafting down the Zambezi River in Zimbabwe. The guide was giving them instructions before they set off, and he said, when the raft flips, and the man said, wait, what, when? Not if, when. What do you mean, when the raft flips? He said, when the raft flips, because it will, Stay in the rough water. He said, you will be tempted to swim toward the calm water on the edge of the banks. He said, don't do it because it's in the calm water that the crocodiles will wait for you. <laughs> he said, they are large and they are hungry. So he said, even when the raft flips, stay in the rough water. Can I tell you something? The safest place to be is in the will of God, even if the water's rough, because you will survive. God wants you to survive. Number two, you'll see God at work. Those who go down to the sea in ships, verse 23, who do business on the great waters, verse 24, they shall see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. You know what? God does miracles for people who need miracles. Somebody's like, I've never seen the Lord do any miracle. Maybe you don't need one. It's people who risk. They get in storms. They need miracles. If you play it safe for the rest of your life, you're never going to see it. Our text says you see God at work. 
You see God doing things to accomplish his will. He talks about wonders. You see wonders, amazing things that will literally a wonder is something that makes you go, wow. I'm in awe when I think of what God has done for Lisa and I. I've told, you know, a million times, God made a witch doctor help us in South Africa. That's a wonder. I, I never even met a witch doctor growing up. But in doing the will of God, he made someone involved in black magic. He was the greatest help to us. That's a wonder. You see God at work. Thirdly, our text says, if you'll risk for God, you will get where you need to be. Verse 30, he guides them to their desired haven. You know what? God guides people who are obedient. If you will obey God, the promise is God will get you exactly where you need to be. There's guidance in the moment exactly where we need to be. When Lisa and I left here in 1997 going to Johannesburg, South Africa, that is a massive city. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know where to go. But God guided us in the moment exactly where we should be. You can experience that again and again. One of the things I have absolute confidence in is God will show you what you need to know. He guides obedient people. And then there is ultimate guidance as well, not just in the moment, but it's risk and trouble in deep waters that bring you into your life purpose. Genesis 50, 20 the New Living Translation said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. There, there's something about risking for God that brings you into your life purpose. Lisa and I left here in 1997. We moved to Johannesburg, South Africa, unbelievably different and dangerous from good old Australia. I mean, the, the violence was off the charts. I, we're there, I don't remember if it was the first day, the first morning that we're there, the second morning, I'm opening the paper, and I talk about two guys were having a fight, and a guy pulled out a hand grenade. <laughs> I don't ever remember anybody in Australia fighting with a hand grenade. I, don't, I just don't remember that. I'm like, you're reading the paper, and they stabbed her 172 times. Like, what? Well, what kind of place have we just moved to? Out, outrage. I, I had helpful people in Australia sending me letters. I just read that it's more safe in a war zone than Johannesburg. <laughs> I, I had someone from Australia come visit us one time, and he's saw the violence and the trouble. He said, I would never bring my family here. It's like, oh. oh, yeah, I brought my family here because I hate them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but you know what? In, we went through trouble. We risked. We, we did all that. But it was when we were coming to the end of our time. 2004, my father came to preach in the conference, and he told me of his plan of succession that he wanted me to take over for him. And he was, exp and I'm like, why? And he was explaining one of the things was the risk and the trouble we had gone through in South Africa had prepared. It had done something in us. It had done something in the work of God that he saw that he wanted me to take over for him. That is not why I went. I, I didn't go, this is like a stepping stone. I had, I had no idea, but God's word is true. Now, I'm not saying if you will risk for God, you will take over the fellowship. That is not, <laughs> <laughs> that is not what I'm saying. But you have a purpose in God. Everybody has a life purpose. And it is when you say, God, I will do your will. If that, if that 
makes me feel uncomfortable, I'll do it anyway. If there's a chance it might not work out, I'll do it anyway. I'm going to obey you. I'm going to participate in rescue, which is risky. And out of that, it may be that you will find your life purpose. That might be a place. That might be a ministry. He has a purpose for you. And our text says you're only going to find his wonders in the deep. I want you to bow your heads. Close your eyes all across this place. Thank God, I appreciate your attention. Before we do anything else, I want to give an opportunity. There may be people that are here that you are not right with God. The greatest wonder, the greatest miracle that I could ever tell you about is the miracle of salvation. God is able to save sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are people that are here you are not right with God. You'd be honest. You know that God would not be pleased with the way you're living right now. If you're honest, according to God's word, that you are facing judgment in hell because sin must be punished. But I'm telling you good news, not bad news. The good news is that Jesus loves you. Jesus wants to do a miracle in your heart. He can save you from the inside out. He can set you free from habits, addictions that you can't break. He can take away the guilt and the shame, the stain of sin on the inside. He can bring peace to your mind that's tormented by anxiety. And most of all, he can give you power to live a new life. There are people that are here, you've never experienced that. You've never been born again. That's what Jesus called it. But tonight, you can be born again. Before you leave, you could be a different person. How do you do that? You pray with an honest heart. If you pray and admit your need before God, He can reach down on the inside where no one can see and change you from the inside out. How many of you here, you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin? You admit that you have sinned, you are a sinner, but you want God to forgive you tonight. If you want to pray and turn from your sin, while every head's bowed, this is private, I want you to do one thing. Lift your hand up. By lifting your hand, you say, Pastor Greg, I need Jesus. I want to turn from my sin. I'm not right with God. I know that. Lift up your hand. How many would there be all across this place? Maybe you're backslidden. Amen. God bless you. How many others? Lift up your hand. I want to pray. I need Jesus. I see that hand. God bless you, man. I appreciate that. At the back, thank you. Some hands are going up. Some of you are backslidden. You were saved, but you turned your back on God. You went back to sin. He has not turned his back on you. Backslider, come home tonight. Let God change you. Let God do a miracle in you. How many backsliders lift up your hand? I want to come home. I want to get right with God. Thank God I appreciate these people are being honest. I want every one of you that lifted your hand, I want you to stand up to your feet. I want to help pray for you. Stand up. God bless you. Thank you. At the back, stand up. Stand up. That's your risk right now. Stand up. Amen. Don't matter what other people think. Stand up for God. Now, those that are standing, come here. I'm going to have someone pray with you. Come out of your seat right now. God bless you. Thank you. At the back, there were some hands. Don't be shy. You come. God's dealing with you. You want to get right with God. God bless you. I appreciate all these that are being honest. Kneel down in the front here. God bless you. Thank you. Make sure there's a man praying with every man, a woman with every woman. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anywhere in the front. Anywhere in the front here. Thank God. Thank God. Just kneel down. Need a lady to pray there. God bless every one of these. Thank God. Some more. I need someone to pray with these children over here. Thank God. If there's someone near you, you don't know if they're right with God, why don't you gently invite them, give them courage. 
enable them to come and do business with God. I want you all to stand up to your feet. I want to invite you to come and talk to God about risk. Tell God, I'm going to obey you. Some of you need to lay down your pride. Tell God, forgive me for letting my pride get in the way. I'm willing to risk for you. The altars are open. They're going to sing while people are coming right now. Let's praise God for his goodness right now. God, we thank you. God, we are grateful for your goodness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I want to pray for you right now. God, I need you. I need you. There are people here that they have struggled to risk, to step out in faith. God, I'm asking that you will implant in them supernatural faith. Help them to believe you. 
Oh, God, let them know the joy of stepping out. Let them see wonders in the deep. God, I'm asking, I rebuke discouragement and fear, rejection and the fear of rejection that would keep people from responding to your will, Lord God. I'm asking that we would be a people, God, our default answer is yes. Let that be true of us, Lord God, so that you are able to use us to bring about your will in the earth. God, I thank you in advance for everything you're going to do on our behalf and through our lives, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's praise God together again. God, I'm grateful. Oh, God, I believe you right now. Lord God, I believe that you are able. God is good to us. Thank God. Amen. I, I'm believing that God will help you. One of the things always I work with disciples is I want every disciple to have the joy and the thrill of God using them. It, it's an incredible feeling when you step out and do what God tells you to do and you see God help. That's, I want you to have that because it's addictive. Once you see God do one thing, it, it enables you to step out in other areas. And I'm, I'm encouraging you to do that for yourself. Thank God. How many of you here are sick in your body? You sickness, injury, or disease, lift up your hand. There's something wrong. You need healing. Stand up to your feet. I want to pray for you. And I wasn't preaching on healing, but I want to believe God. God has been doing great miracles. I'm going to, I'm going to help you to pray in just a moment. Two very simple things. We're going to pray. We're going to command that spirit that's causing the problem in your body to leave. We're going to command the body to work. And then when we finish praying, I want you to do what you could not do before. If there was pain, bending, you're going to bend. If it was, you, there's a certain motion you can't do. If there's something you can't see, you can't hear, you're going to check yourself. When we pray, it's irrelevant if you feel anything or not. Many people, it's as they test themselves, that's when God does miracles. I want you to put your hand on your body where the problem is. You got more than one problem, put your hand on your head. God's smart enough to know where the power needs to go. He can help you. I want you to say this out loud. Say, in Jesus' name, I take dominion and I cast out every spirit of infirmity, injury, sickness, and disease from my body, I command my body be made whole, function normally from this moment in Jesus' name. And I thank you for it. Let's pray right now. God, touch them. Healing power right now. In Jesus' name, I rebuke sickness and infirmity. I command it to go. I command those bodies be made whole right now. Be healed right now in Jesus' name. Every one of them. Now, I want you to check yourself. If there was a lump, I want you to feel for it. If it hurt to press, press. If it hurt to raise an arm or a certain motion, do that right now. If it hurt to bend, check it right now. Wherever there was pain, I want you to test yourself. I know some of you can't until later. That's fine. Right now. Now, how many of you right now, you already know that God healed you? The pain is gone. Here? Here? Yes? Yes? What did God do for you? The shoulder. What was wrong? I've had a lot of pain in it. How long for? The last month and a half. Month and a half you had pain. Let me see it now. Move it around. Any pain now? No. Free motion now. Oh, Without pain. Thank God. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Thank God. Who else? Who else? You already know God healed you. Who's that? Sully? Frozen shoulder. Frozen shoulder for how long? Probably about a year and a half. Got healed a while ago, so about 90%, and that's feeling very, very good now. And now you can move it freely? Free motion? And also a sore neck, which is amazing. And that's amazing. <laughs> Praise God. Isn't that wonderful?
Thank God. Thank God. How many others? You already know. Here, what was wrong? Yes, I had an issue with my knee. Your knee? How long for? For a while, on and off, of course, last item. And uh, I said to Lord last night that it was causing me a lot of trouble. Yeah. And now, what do you have to do to, to well, test I can it? Bend down, which I can do before. You couldn't do that before. And now you can. Thank God. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Amen. God wants to heal yes. sick bodies. You need to believe God for that. Thank God for all these. I am looking forward to all that God's going to do in these churches. I'm praying for you for a building. Believing that God's going to open doors and give you a supernatural building. That is, that is God's will for you. He's going to help you. Thank God. I'm, I really do appreciate if you would just be praying for Lisa and I always. I know that you do. But if you pray for us and, that uh, God will help us in our ministry. If God helps us, he helps you. So it's kind of sanctified self-interest. <laughs> help you to pray. Thank God. I'm going to turn the service to Pastor. God bless you. And let's, let's stand right where we are. Just stay right where we are. Let's, let's stand and we're going to dismiss in prayer. Again, invite you back to our next rally uh, with Pastor Rich Cox and your pastor. If you're not from Footscray, your pastor will let you know when that is. But appreciate everyone uh, coming out again. We're going to dismiss right now. Vinod, ask God's blessing, please. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the word, O Lord. Father, help us, O Lord God, to be a disciple, O God, to take the risk of my father in your name. O oh God, that you have promised to oh my Father that you will be, O oh Lord God, in the midst of the trouble and the storms, O oh Lord God, to deliver us, O oh my Father. We thank you for healing the bodies, O oh Lord God. I pray that you will bless the people, O oh Father God, our hearts, O oh Father, as we come for next service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Drive carefully, please.